But here's what I want you to see, believer. In Christ, you are that. If you were not that, you couldn't even call him father. If you were not that, you would know nothing of his spirit, of his presence. I'm not saying that when a believer becomes a Christian, they become perfectly righteous. What I am saying is this. When when a believer, when a Christian, when a person becomes a Christian, when they become a believer, Christ's righteousness is imputed to them. So that God now, you see, what you need to understand is Christ did not just die for you. Christ lived for you. He lived a perfect life for you. And he always, always, when he was living, he always heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He obeyed everything. He was always pleasing to the father. And when you believed in Christ, all your sins were forgiven by virtue of the cross. But you were granted, you were declared forensically, legally declared righteous before God in Christ. That's what you are now. Now, let me let me share with you. This comes from Charles Leiter, a dear friend of mine that's really helped me in this area. You, the man, man has two problems. He has two problems, and that's all. One, he's under the condemnation of sin. Two, he's under the power of sin. That's the only two problems man has. Under the condemnation of sin... He's under the power of sin. When Christ died for you on that tree and rose again from the dead. And then when you believed in Christ, the condemnation of sin, that problem was gone forever. Okay, You're righteous in him. You've accepted in him. God sees you as altogether lovely in him. Not one spot or blemish, he says, in him. So your condemnation problem was removed. But you don't just have a condemnation problem. Slavery to sin. So by faith, you were justified, which took away the problem of condemnation before God. But regeneration took care of the problem of the power of sin in your life. Those two things. And a lot of guys get off balance because they give have such a low view of regeneration. When Christ died for me and I believed in him, I was justified in Christ through his death on that tree, through his perfect life, his righteousness imputed to me. I stand before God now and there is therefore now no condemnation. But also, I am no longer a slave to sin because the Holy Spirit has regenerated my heart, regenerated my life. I have a new nature and I walk in newness of life. So both of those problems now have now been taken care of. Now, it's not to deny that there's a struggle with sin, but there's a difference between struggle with sin and slavery to sin. Welcome back to your Narrow Path Doctrine. My name is Jim. I want to talk about the doctrine of imputed righteousness this time around. Now, believe it or not, this doctrine is actually controversial out there. There are some who deny the doctrine of imputed righteousness. And I have to wonder, the people that do so, are they the same people who think that they chose God? God didn't choose them. They chose God. They made the decision for God and asked God into their heart. That's the way it seems really out there for for the most part, because it's almost as if their pride gets in the way and they think, well, you know what? I'm more righteous than my neighbor, so that should be good enough for God. I do more good things than bad things, so that should be enough to to get into heaven. Yeah, no, 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 it really isn't. We're going to see that here in this episode. So the doctrine of imputed righteousness, it lies at the heart of the Reformed understanding of salvation and justification. And by the way, another word for Reformed is, oh, I don't know, biblical. According to this doctrine, God counts or imputes Christ's righteousness to believers, making them righteous in his sight, despite their sinfulness. Thank God for that. This is a pivotal point in the debate of justification by faith alone versus works. And it highlights the sufficiency of Christ's work on behalf of sinners. Now, the key distinction here is that the righteousness which justifies is not inherent to believers, but is credited to them by faith. Let's dig deeper into this doctrine here. The Bible clearly teaches that all human beings are sinners and none are righteous in themselves. (laughs) Some people come against that as well. This sets the stage for understanding why imputed righteousness is necessary. This verse says it all, Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
This verse from Paul's letter to the Romans echoes the teaching of the Old Testament from Psalm 14, 1 through 3. It highlights the universal problem of sin. No one has the ability to achieve righteousness before God on their own. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul makes it clear that everyone has fallen short of God's glory and moral standard. It's a pretty high standard. This condition leaves humanity in a state of helplessness and deserving of God's judgment. Romans 6.23 Thus, man cannot earn righteousness through works or self-effort because sin permeates all aspects of human life. That is the sin that we all inherited from Adam. God's standard for righteousness is absolute perfection. His law demands complete and total obedience, which no human can fulfill due to their sinful nature. James 2.10 tells us this, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So you're trying to keep the law? Have you ever lied in your life? Sorry, you're out. This verse shows that even a single violation of God's law renders a person guilty and deserving of punishment. If righteousness were to come by the law, then it must be perfect, which is impossible for humans to achieve. Matthew 5.48 tells us this, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Here Jesus sets the standard of righteousness as nothing less than divine perfection. This again demonstrates the impossibility of obtaining righteousness by human efforts. Because we cannot achieve righteousness through the law, God, God provided a solution, and that solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. This was his plan all along. It was not a reaction to man sinning. God had a plan all along. I hear some channels teaching against this. It's like God said, oh no, oh no, Adam, Adam and Eve, they sinned, so what shall we do now? No, God knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He's outside of time. Stop with the false teaching. God knew all along exactly what was going to happen as he sees the beginning from the end. Isaiah 46.10 Christ's life and sacrificial death fulfill the requirements of the law on behalf of his sheep. Romans 5.19 tells us, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Adam's disobedience brought sin and condemnation to all mankind. Conversely, through the obedience of Christ, his perfect fulfillment of the law and his sacrificial death, his shedding of blood, many are made righteous. Those many are whom the Father chose before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is perhaps the clearest expression of the concept of imputation. Christ, who knew no sin, was treated as sin for our sake. In turn, we are treated as righteous because of Christ's righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is imputed or credited to believers, though it is not their own. When God looks at you in Christ, he sees Christ and his righteousness. It is the only way that anyone can stand before and in the presence of a perfectly righteous and holy God. The righteousness of Christ is not automatically applied to everyone. We're not universalists here. It is credited to those who believe in Christ by faith, those who are called, Romans 8.30. Justification, therefore, is by faith alone, not by works. Romans 4.3 says, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Paul uses the example of Abraham to illustrate how justification has always been by faith. The Old Testament saints were not saved by any other means or another gospel. Stop it with the false teaching out there. Abraham was not justified by works, but by believing in the promises of God, which was counted or imputed to him as righteousness. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. This verse reinforces the notion that righteousness comes through faith, not through works. It is God who justifies the ungodly, and he does so by crediting them with the righteousness of Christ.
Justification is a forensic or legal declaration where God declares the sinner righteous, not on the basis of their works, but because of Christ's righteousness imputed to them. Romans 8, 33 through 34 says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Since God has declared the believer righteous on the basis of Christ's righteousness, no one can bring any charge against them. Their justification is secure because it rests on Christ's finished work, and it can't be lost. While works do not justify us before God, they are evidence of genuine faith. Imputed righteousness leads to a transformed life marked by the fruit of obedience. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Your works that you are doing as a Christian right now God foreordained them. Believers are saved by grace through faith, not by works. However, that faith that justifies is never alone. It produces good works as a result of being united to Christ. And there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. If someone claims to be saved yet is living in constant unrepentant sin, yeah, they're, they're probably not saved. They are just merely professing Christ. So, in conclusion, the doctrine of imputed righteousness teaches that we are justified before God, not by our own righteousness, but by the righteousness of Christ credited to us. This righteousness is received by faith alone, apart from works. Christ's obedience and sacrificial death satisfy the demands of the law, and his righteousness is imputed to us. Therefore, we can stand before God fully justified, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. Philippians 3.9 says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This is the glory of the gospel. We are clothed in Christ's righteousness. And because of that, we are declared righteous in the sight of God. Sin comes into the world. And judgment comes because of sin. And judgment starts with the serpent. And the judgment on the serpent has to do with the fact that the woman is going to bear a seed. And at some point, we don't know when, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the snake, even though the snake is going to bruise his heel. Now the text doesn't tell us when this particular promised seed is going to come. However, when the fullness of time had come, the promised seed came. Now it was necessary that the promised seed be born of a woman, otherwise, God lied to the snake and to you and to me. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So whoever comes to deliver us from the sin of the first Adam has to be born of the seed of the woman, but somehow he cannot inherit the sin of Adam. That's why when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. No, no, why is this significant? This is significant because the wages of sin is death. If Jesus has sin of his own, if he's born of ordinary generation like you and me, then he has a sin debt to pay and he can't pay anybody else's. But because when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. By the way, he's not just born of a woman, he's born under the law so that he might redeem those who are under the law. And what does this redemption look like? I'm so glad you asked because both sides of this are incredibly important. He's born under the law because we are guilty 
born in sin, but we are also guilty because this sin nature is the very reason that we break and violate the law of God. So we have a double problem. Problem number one, we have the, the sin that we were born with and we're guilty because of that. Problem number two, we have this law of God that we are commanded to keep and because of the sin that we're born with, we are wholly unable and unwilling to keep this law. So any man born of ordinary generation is going to have this same problem. Number one, God requires those of us who are born under the law to keep the law and be actually righteous. But you will not and cannot keep the law and be actually righteous because you're born under the federal headship of Adam and with a sin nature. You, you in trouble. He has to be born under the law and keep the whole law so that he can be actually righteous, which is why this is God's son, because he is the only one who can be born without a sin nature and can keep the whole law. Why is this significant? I'm glad you asked, because he has to fulfill two sides of the redemption coin through what is often referred to as his active and his passive obedience. In his active obedience, he keeps the whole law and he is actually righteous, which is important because that means he can impute actual righteousness to you and to me. And you can't stand before God without actual righteousness and you can't gain that righteousness because you're born in sin. So Christ keeps the whole law and is actually righteous and he can impute that righteousness to you. But then, as a man, Christ can actually take the penalty that we owe to God for our sin and deal with the other side of it. So that now there can be a double imputation. My sin imputed to Christ, who is born of a woman and can therefore have my sin placed on him because the sin belongs to man. But because he's the God-man, his righteousness can be imputed to me so that Christ can die a vicarious, substitutionary, atoning death on my behalf, satisfying the wrath of God against my actual sin and my inherited sin and imputing to me the righteousness that is required for me to stand before God in right standing and righteousness. Amen. This is why when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. All right, that is going to wrap up this episode here on Narrow Path Doctrine. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up and, of course, share it with others. And if you haven't done so as of yet, click the subscribe button and the notification bell to get updates when new videos like this one come out. So until next time, remember, true doctrine fuels a living, breathing faith. God bless.